Welcome to the Accelerating Operational Performance Podcast. I'm Greg Schinkel, your host, president of Unique Training and Development and US-based frontline leadership systems. And of course, our mandate, our mission here at the podcast is really to give you some insights and tips how to build a high-performing culture, how to get your projects unstuck and accelerated, and help you on your professional growth and career path. And today, my guest is someone who I am familiar with, which always makes it weird when I have to read the introduction, but I want to make sure I cover everything properly. Um, but I had the pleasure of, uh, our guest today is Mike Michael Kerr. Uh, Mike, he goes by Mike Kerr, and that's his website, mikekerr.com. And um, I had the pleasure of following Mike in the leadership uh, succession at a national professional speaking association. So not only is Mike an accomplished author that we'll hear about today, but also um, Mike leads by example. He really does lead, uh, lead with what he considers to be the right thing. He does that and practices it as a leader himself. So let me tell you a little bit more about Michael Kerr. Mike Kerr is a Canadian Hall of Fame speaker and trainer who speaks on workplace culture, leadership, and businesses that leverage their humor resources to drive extraordinary results. Michael is the author of nine books, including The Humor Advantage, The Jerk-Free Workforce, or Workplace, and Small Moments, Big Outcomes, How Leaders Create Cultures That Fuel Extraordinary Results. With 25 years of experience, he believes culture is the number one competitive advantage and requires intentional effort. Not only is he one of Canada's top speakers, he's also known as the workplace energizer, and his blog is a top 35 workplace resource globally. Welcome to the podcast, Michael Kerr. Hey, Greg, it's great to see you and so good to be here. Yeah, no, I mean, we have we have a good history and, and given that we've both served in leadership capacities, uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Plus, I've known you to be a person that really cares deeply about culture. Maybe you could give us some insights into how did you navigate yourself just towards this focus on workplace culture? Sure, yeah. And and by the way, speaking of our time together, I have to let everybody watching know that that Greg is a great person to work with despite all the hijinks that he sometimes participate. But, thank you, Michael. And, and yes, there yeah. are hijinks and people there, know me as there, being there were, both there were serious, hijinks, but so. also I've got a dark humor, humor side as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Greg. So, so yeah, I got, I got interested in this topic. Uh, I think the way a lot of people get interested in the topic, it was, it was a source of frustration for me. In a previous lifetime, I worked in what can only be described as a soul-sucking, fun-sucking workplace that was just sucking the life out of me. One of those, those jobs, one of those workplace cultures where you'd come home and just want to crash on the couch and veg for the rest of the night. And I realized I had to do something else with my life. I decided to quit this soul-sucking organization and make it my mission to, through through speaking and writing, to talk about how work is too important. Work has a huge impact on our lives. It is the single biggest use of our waking hours in this short journey called life. It affects our marriages and family life and mental and physical health. It affects who we hang around with, where we live. So many impacts on us that go beyond a paycheck. And so I decided to make it my little mission to talk about how work should not be sucking the life out of us, how work should be a place that actually gives us energy instead of robbing us of energy, a place where we want to show up on a Monday morning and be our best because it is one of the single biggest impacts on our lives. And I started out, Greg, going down the, the humor in the workplace path. I started because I was known as having a good sense of humor as a manager in my previous jobs. I was always fascinated by that topic and the role humor could play in the workplace. But I quickly realized that really what I was talking about was workplace culture. I was talking actually about the impact humor and fun could have on a positive workplace culture, but also how there's a chicken and egg relationship, right? How humor and a little levity at work reflects a positive workplace culture. If you're working in a supportive, values-based, 
workplace where you feel trusted and appreciated and respected and all those good things we can maybe get into here, then it's easy to have a good sense of humor, I think. Yeah. So I think, you know, you, you even have this position. So first of all, people should understand, we're, we're talking today with Michael Kerr. And of course, his website is mikekerr.com. And if you have an association or a group and you need a, a speaker, what you can sense from Michael's interview with us today is he just brings it both in a humorous way, but also in a way, I think the humor basically allows the medicine to go down, right? Which is really to help people right. become culture leaders. And in fact, you really think that leaders at every level in an organization to focus on being culture leaders first. Can you expand on that a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think everyone, especially this day and age, has to think of themselves first and foremost as a culture leader for the simple fact that we know no matter what organization you're in, what industry you're in, what business you're in, how big or small your organization is, culture is the number one driver of success. It is your number one competitive advantage. It affects absolutely every aspect of how your business operates. It affects how happy your employees are and therefore how productive they are and how present they are at work. It affects employee turnover rates, how well you can attract great employees. It affects the stress levels and resiliency in your workplace, how well your employees communicate with one another and work in teams effectively. It affects your customer service and your customer experience. I mean, every aspect of your organization is affected by culture. And it truly is your number one competitive advantage. I've asked leaders all over the globe, a very simple, perhaps cliche question, but I've always asked them, so what's been more important in your success? You have this phenomenal business here. Has it been your business strategy, do you think, or your culture? 95% without missing a beat have told me, oh, it's our culture, culture is everything. Of course you need a good, strong business strategy. But if you don't have the right culture, in place to drive that business strategy, you're not going to be as successful as you might otherwise be. So I think leaders need to think of themselves as, as champions of their culture, of, of torch bearers for their culture. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I, I can, you know, you can tell that Michael's enthusiastic about this and he walks his talk. And Mike, your ninth book just came out recently, I think, in the last uh, few months. And it's called Small Moments, Big Outcomes. And you really, oh, there you go. Uh, and you talk about eight essential traits of an inspiring culture leader. Can you give us a few of those traits? Yeah, I won't walk through all eight, obviously, but, but a couple of the key ones for me, one of them is just this idea that, that real leadership is about connecting at that human level. It's about interacting with people. All the other stuff we do at work, right? That's the stuff of management. And I'm not dissing management. Some of my best friends are managers. We need strong management skills. Of course we do, it's essential. But there's a fundamental difference between being a manager and being a leader. I, th I think it's difficult to lead paperwork or to lead a timesheet, right? That's the stuff of management, all the stuff you're doing, all the bureaucracy, the filing, the paperwork, all, all, all that kind of stuff is management. When it comes to leadership though, that's about energizing, interacting with your people. I don't know how many of you out there who are married have tried to manage your spouse. <laughs> it's a really effective way to find out how comfortable your couch is or is uh, Nobody wants to be managed but they want to be led. So, Michael, I, I think, well, first of all, thank you for that. I'll take that tip home with me. But here's the, here's the thing that we've been talking about internally as we kind of move from just doing frontline leadership training to also doing middle management and even a new site leader program that we have. And it's around this idea of organizational distractions so the things that you talk about, like managing things like timesheets and things. So if somebody's going to be offended by this because they're going to say, my job in the company is to manage the timesheets and do that, which is, of course, an essential part of running the mechanics of the business. But we have to watch out that we're not distracted by these things that are management tasks and forget about the culture tasks. So please, again, uh, some additional traits that you talk about in your new book. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's a really good point, Greg, right? And it's, you know, culture is about how you do the things you do, how that you do the things you're already doing, right? It's just maybe being more aware that every time you interact with another human being, you have the chance to either add something to your culture or take away something from your culture. 
In fact, there was a study by Harvard that looked into the best indicators of future successful leaders. And the number one trait they found was the most effective leaders were, and this, this was their terminology, they were positive energizers. They don't mean this in some woo woo new age kind of way. They just made people feel good about themselves. When they interacted with people at work, they were present. They put down their phones, they listened, they made them feel cared about in, in terms of the human being showing up at work and not just the widget showing up from nine to five. The simple litmus test in my books is, are people happier to see you come in the room as opposed to seeing you leave the room, right? That's the litmus test. So that that's obviously a huge characteristic of leadership. Remember yeah. the importance of that. Two other ones that I, I would really stress are important too, I think is, is accountability. One is as a leader, making sure you are accountable to your employees. That's, that's incredibly important if you're going to build trust, if you're going to build respect as a leader. And not just with yourself building a culture, to bring this back out to culture again, building a culture of accountability where everyone understands that it is their job to step up and be responsible and be accountable for their own behaviors, for their own, for their own words that they use, their own actions. And then a third characteristic oh, oh, that I, I think is really important. Actually, I'm going to pause you there. Yeah. So on accountability, it's interesting. I'm glad you raised accountability because it kind of ties it into driving results. Um, I think you've hit on something that most people don't think about, that if you have a lack of accountability, one of the areas you should look at is your culture. Because if the culture is people not wanting to take ownership and responsibility, uh, for the results that they're generating or the activities that they're responsible for, that probably is a reflection of the culture. And so just having a culture where people feel like, I want to do a good job, I want to own the part of it that I'm responsible for and deliver consistent results. So I think you've, you've tied up something because clients of ours keep saying, we want people to be more accountable. We want them to own what they do. And I go, well, it's interesting to think whether the culture supports accountability or whether it supports a lack of accountability and excuses. And sorry, you did have one more that you wanted to share. Yeah, no, no, no. But but jumping on, on what you just said, it, absolutely, it's a, it's a cultural thing, right? It's, it's about making sure that people understand that at any level in the organization, including frontline employees, are potentially leaders on your team. Leadership has nothing to do, I mean, this is old cliche stuff, right? But it has nothing to do with your job title or what's on your business card. It's, it's about who you are, it's about who you're being. And a huge part of that is being accountable. What I love that some companies do in terms of this topic is they stress to their employees that you will be assessed, you will be evaluated, you will be measured in your job, not just on the metrics of whatever your job is, you will also be assessed. In fact, half of our weighting of you will be assessed on how well you contribute to our workplace culture. Are you contributing to the kind of culture where your teammates are happy to show up on a Monday morning? Or are you doing something that is getting in the way of that? And so that message has to be communicated and it has to be part of your culture that we need everyone to step up as leaders and take responsibility and accountability. And then the third trait I was going to get to that I think is, is really key, I, I think none of the other traits matter without this one, and it's self-awareness. I think if we're not self-aware as leaders, we don't even know that perhaps we need to change some of these behaviors or learn new things at work or, or assess our own skills or our own values and how well we're stepping up as a leader to lead the people around us. Everything, I think, starts with self-awareness. It's interesting that you say that because in our frontline leadership program, we, we talk about, you know, ask people of all the leaders you've ever worked for or managers or supervisors, what percentage of them were good, effective leaders in your opinion, just subjectively. And it usually comes up to around a 50-50 proposition. So that means every time your, your leader changes, it's like flipping a coin and heads, it's going to be as good or better than it was. Tails, it's going to suck for a couple of years while, you know, you, you endure a weaker leader. But... When we go into, does your, in your opinion, does your weaker leader, do they know about their shortcomings or not? It's usually 80-20 uh, saying that the leader doesn't have the self-awareness. And then I go, why don't the leaders have an understanding that they may not be as effective as they could be? 
and we've agreed that it's generally a performance feedback vacuum. It's not good form in your exit interview to say, screw you, I'm out of here. So what people do is they say, you know, I've taken a job closer to home or better for my family or some other reason. So leaders are left really not being told that they should probably increase. So then that leaves self-awareness as the really the only tool that most leaders have or every leader has at their disposal if they just think about what are, what are the approaches that you're using? How are those approaches either working for you or, or against you? And I think, Mike, you've talked about leaders being more intentional. And I'm wondering maybe that dovetails into this once you increase your level of self-awareness. It does, for sure. For sure, there's overlap there. Everything happens. You know, I talk about that with cultures, too. Great cultures don't happen by accident, right? You can't fake it. You can't go buy your culture at Ikea, as I always remind my audiences. Even if you tried, you wouldn't understand the instructions and you would have parts left over. So you've got to be intentional about your culture. You have to be intentional about your leadership. Great leadership doesn't just happen. And so I talk a, a lot about that in my book. I have a whole bunch of tips about how to be more intentional about your leadership, but some very simple things that you can do, and, and you just touched on that in terms of the self-awareness piece, is asking for feedback from your employees. Yeah. And, and that takes a lot of courage, right? You know, everybody's scared, to, or a lot of people are scared to ask for feedback, right? Because we might hear some uncomfortable truths but if you are in a true leadership position, a supervisory management position, you need to ask for feedback from your employees to learn about what it is that, that you maybe need to be doing better. And you can keep it really simple, right? Really simple always works for me. You know, what, what's one thing I maybe need to start doing that would make your job easier? What's one thing I need to stop doing? that would make your job easier, right? Even if it's that simple a conversation, but asking for feedback, being, being courageous enough to asking for help and asking for advice is one of the most powerful things you can do as a leader. This isn't a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength yeah. to ask your employees for their advice and help. Actually, and it my, shows that you respect them, my, you respect their wisdom. My production team just held up a cue card with three things they'd like me to stop doing. Uh, effective immediately, if possible. So uh, they're, they're already three. doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the funny thing here, Mike, is I I would agree with you, and I think the reason we're scared about feedback is because I think most of us take a negative bias to what we're going to hear, and I think you'd be surprised as a leader that people do acknowledge the things that you do bring that are positive, and usually the things that you're bringing that are negative, if you're open-minded, are just little things that you do probably without thinking about them, and it would be easy for you to stop doing them or do less of them. Um, exactly. You're just not aware, right? So again, it gets back to that, oh, I, I didn't even know that was annoying people. Thank you for telling me. And here's the thing too, right? The more you do this, the more you ask for feedback, the more you implement some of these things, the easier it becomes. It's about normalizing this, right? Normalizing feedback conversations in the workplace. So, Michael, I know, I know you spend a lot of time talking about values. And so just, again, for the audience's benefit, I would say that a lot of company values are the same cookie cutter ones as you'd walk in from one company to the next the, uh, the saying is, is, is it a W-O-W, -W, which is not wow in a good way, but words on the wall, or is it something that people would see demonstrated through uh, the words and actions that they saw? And so when I think of value, if somebody says, what do you value? You could look at where do you invest your time, your energy, what do you talk about? And maybe you can expand on that. What are the, some of the things that you say that leaders can do to essentially act their values out loud? Yeah, there's three things, and 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 thanks for setting that up so well because we do know there's there's so many stories of you know values going up on the on the nice posters with the puppies and unicorns and rainbows, and you get the team once a year together to hold hands and sing "We Are the World" because your values make you feel so good. But here's the challenge I always give to my audiences: right, look at your list of inspiring values and ask yourself this: Who is going to disagree with any of those statements? I like give a value like we believe in teamwork. Oh, isn't that, do you think anyone's going to say in a job interview, I want you to know I'm not a team player. I've got some anger issues, don't really care for humans, right? Nobody's going to say that. So you need to be serious about your values, which means three things. Number one, you need to translate what those words actually mean. You need to turn them into example stories, turn them into concrete behaviors. 
so everyone understands what that actually looks like, what it feels like, what it is and what it isn't as well. I think it's important. So if we talk about a value like teamwork, what does that really mean and what does it not mean? And then the second thing, of course, you have to do, especially as a boss, as a leader, is make sure you're modeling these values out loud. In fact, the number of times I've gone into companies to interview, to research their culture, and I've been told that the leader that I wanted to meet with is out picking up garbage in the parking lot or down on the factory floor with their sleeves rolled up, helping fix a piece of equipment or carrying a package out for a customer. It happens all the time. And they're doing that, they've told me, to be visible living their values out loud, to be seen modeling what they want to see in the people around them. So you have to model those values. And then the third piece of the puzzle is you can't treat them like slogans. They can't just be sleazy, sleazy, <laughs> sleazy. Definitely, definitely do not do sleazy slogans. That is, that will get you in trouble with HR every time. They can't be cheesy slogans. They have to be more than words on the wall. You have to hold your employees accountable for living those values out loud, and then also celebrate and recognize and appreciate your employees when they do live them out loud in spectacular ways. So those, those are the three keys, yeah. right? Translate them, model them, and use them as lines in the sand. Awesome. You know what? That's so, so helpful. Again, we're talking with Michael Kerr. You can visit uh, his website at mikekerr.com. He's got nine books, and we're talking about some of the insights from those books today. But he's also a, a Hall of Fame speaker and uh, brings a lot of value to your organization, both in terms of his uh, humor that he uses in his delivery, but also research-based insights into company culture. Mike, you, you and I uh, work together in this not, not-for-profit volunteer uh, leadership role, and we worked on some longer projects. And I know that you have some things to say about how people can, can get longer-term projects, keep them on track, see them to the finish line. I wondered if you could share some of those insights. Yeah, I, I, I hear this all the time, right? Especially when you've got a long-term project that people, of course, motivation starts to flag, people lose interest. So it's really key that you as a leader, as a project team leader, you keep that momentum up. And there's a few simple ways of doing that. One is, one is to figure out, and, and anything I think can be turned into a scorecard. If you can visibly show the progress that you are making and track that and celebrate the small wins, we know that celebrating small wins has a disproportionate impact beyond what just that small win represents. So you're, you're constantly keeping people motivated to move in that direction. I think another thing you have to do as a leader is to keep, keep being that cheerleader and championing, championing the reason why you're doing this, right? Keep selling the vision, keep selling the end goal, why this matters. You have to be that cheerleader uh, and making sure you build in some celebration and recognition throughout the project too. I'm a huge fan of having a, a halftime show, for example, through a big project, right? Now, it doesn't have to be as big as the Super Bowl halftime, but you know, something, right? To kind of lift up spirits when we know people are starting to maybe lose a little momentum. And then even something near the finish line, because we know from a lot of research, you get 80% to, towards the end of a project, 90%. And then that's when things sometimes get really bogged down and you get frustrated because you can see the light, but the light keeps getting a little further away. So holding a, a celebration, like we're, we're almost there folks, kind of party <laughs> rallying celebration just to keep the, yeah. the motivation up. And then making sure if you're working on a project, make sure you plan this into the project planning that at the end of this project, you have something planned in terms of a celebration to wrap this up properly. Don't just move on to the next project. Make sure you celebrate and appreciate your employees in a significant way once that project is done. Yeah, I think you're, you're raising an excellent point, which is, and I'm one of those task-oriented people. I'm like, okay, on to the next thing. And that actually does uh, two things, I guess, wrong. One is you don't get to acknowledge and celebrate the success. And, and we believe that almost everything should be focused on accomplishments as opposed to gaps and problems. Um, but you also miss just the learning that comes from, hey, let's talk about how why this was as successful as it was and think about how we persevered and overcame some obstacles as we worked on it. So you raise an excellent point. Now, you've got a great book title called The Jerk-Free Workplace. Uh, 
And you, you do write about the idea of even frontline. Oh, you're going to grab that book and hold it up for us. That's right. Remember, you can buy all Michael's books uh, through his website at MikeKerr.com. And if you act today, we're going to throw in a set of steak knives. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so you talk about uh, the jerk-free workplace and how especially even frontline leaders need to learn how to lead leaders. Can you uh, tell us about that? Yeah, we've talked a little bit about that as well. You know, I, 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 I titled the book, it's a bit of a cheeky title, right? The Jerk-Free Workplace because, uh, well, nobody wants to work with a jerk, right? It's, it's maybe self-evident, but, but let's start there as a starting point to make sure that our employees understand. And I kind of look at this as a spectrum, Greg. So at one end of the spectrum, one end of the spectrum, you've got people that are maybe doing jerk-like things that are potentially even driving some of your good ploys away to leave your company, to leave your team, that are driving people nuts, that are demoralizing employees, causing stress. So I think as a leader, you need to have those conversations about, again, just what does it mean to be a good team player? What does it mean to be a good neighbor with your teammates at work? And very often it is just those simple little things that bug people. Uh, and so it's about raising awareness, but you have to have those conversations. And then if we think about that spectrum again, so, okay, we want to make sure we're, we're not acting like jerks as a minimum, but then moving along that spectrum, can we coach, encourage, mentor our employees again to think like leaders, to think like a leader, to be accountable, to step up and be responsible for their work, to, to look at their work through a lens of the culture. How are they contributing to your team environment, to your workplace culture? Are they creating an environment where, again, people want to show up on a Monday morning or where people are dreading to show up on a Monday morning? And so encouraging people to think like leaders. And I think you have to implicitly say this. Just tell your employees, we want you to think like a leader. So we're going to ask you for your opinions. We want you to think. We are paying you to think here. We want your ideas. That means you've got to make sure you're relentlessly working on your communication and relentlessly working on giving your employees a real voice so they truly feel like they can contribute to the future of your organization. How else do we expect employees to be loyal and passionate and excited about coming into work and want to share their ideas unless they feel like they are co-creating the future of your work? Awesome. Awesome. Now, one thing, uh, and again, I want to reiterate, because I've, I, uh, Michael was the president of a board that I was also on, and eventually I followed him up as the president the following year. What I can say is what you're seeing in Michael today is exactly the culture that he created on that board, and it really made people feel good about serving, because sometimes you get onto boards and you're like, oh, it's, it's okay, or it's an annoyance, but Michael, you always made it fun. And one of the things Thank that you've you. espoused, and it goes all the way back to one of your earliest topics that you continue to weave in despite your 25 years of expertise in now building healthy workplace cultures is this idea of humor. And I know probably, uh, I think most people appreciate humor. If you don't appreciate humor, there's a different issue. But let's say that people appreciate humor. I think it's getting more difficult because there's so many more guardrails around what uh, what uh, is okay as humor or not. But how do you navigate that given that you're a, a specialist in helping people with humor at work? Yeah. And I, I'm always careful to say, look, when I talk about bringing more humor to work, especially maybe as a leader, as a boss, I am not talking about being a stand-up comedian, right? I'm not talking about telling jokes. Uh, it's not even always about being funny. Having a sense of humor is about just bringing more humanity into your workplace, into your team. It's about being more authentic, more real. It's about laughing at those things you have no control over at work, which is quite a bit some days, I'm sure. And especially as a leader, it's about laughing at yourself more often. Is it not a truism after all, Greg, that the more seriously a person takes themselves, the less seriously we end up taking that person, right? So if you're taking yourself overly serious as a leader, I guarantee you, your employees are gonna stop taking you seriously because you're taking yourself so bloody seriously. And when it comes to navigating, as you say, that maybe these, these treacherous waters these days, you know, how can you have fun at work without getting fired, right? I, I would just offer a few things. Again, it, it, it's not about telling jokes. It's, it's about using humor in a respectful way. Wait, a wait, wait, way. wait a second, Michael. Uh, did you hear the one about the accountant, the HR person, and the production manager that walked into the bar? 
No, I, I, I did kidding. not. I'm just kidding. But did it's not about those like... types of jokes, or I don't have yes. a punchline for that one. Uh, but we can write one afterwards. That, um, that, that's probably a safe one. <laughs> I, I, I think that that's going to end with a safe with a safe punchline. Here's one thing so, I've noticed, Michael, related to that, and then I, I want you, of course, to finish the thought on humor. No. Is that um, I think I've you know I've been dealing with that, which is. How do you, um, you want to be taken seriously, especially when you're younger in your career, then you kind of start to recognize the absurdness of thinking that you know things for sure, that you really don't know for sure. And I think, um, I really think you're, you're onto something here, which is to try not to take yourself too seriously because you want your team to know that, you know what, we're just trying to do the best that we can for as long as we can and, and help our customers succeed. So anyway, any last thoughts on, on humor and building it in mo- more appropriately yeah, into the workforce? Yeah, and, and that's a really good point, Greg. I mean, if, when you take yourself lightly, it remember, you're the orchestra conductor as a leader in the workplace, right? You set the tone, you set the atmosphere, the mood, you set the music, right? So when you take yourself lightly, it creates that environment where everyone else just feels they can they can be a little more themselves, right? They can breathe a little easier. They don't have to walk on eggshells and and it's okay to be human and make a mistake. But but what I what I hear time and time when I go into workplaces that are known for huge amounts of humor and fun like they're known for that as part of their culture and i asked that very question you know how do you how do you navigate this in this day and age and with, with all the political correctness going on they always look at me like i have three heads and they say it's not an issue and they say it's not an issue for this simple reason you get the humor that i think is reflected in your culture so they will tell me time and time again, we have a very positive, respectful culture. So if you if your humor is disrespectful, they don't view it as a humor issue. They view it as a, an, an issue of disrespect. It's, it's something else not related to humor. Humor is just the tool that you're, you're using to convey that thought or an idea. And there's actually a study, this is fascinating to me, in the International Group of Humor Studies, of which I'm a member, where they looked at the role of the office clown in these different IT companies. And what they found was there was an enormously positive impact of those characters. Those were the people that tend to keep the cultural history alive by retelling stories. They kept morale up. They kept things light when things got boring. They were tension breakers. They asked challenging questions of the senior leadership. There were all these benefits. But when the CEOs were asked, do these office jokers ever cross the line? The answer, I think, is really enlightening and really important. They always said, yeah, of course they do now and then, but don't let the occasional mistake destroy all the positive that those people play in the workplace. And that's what I'd say about humor in in general, right? Don't be so scared of it that you end up squashing any semblance of humanity or compassion or fun in your workplace for fear that there's going to be the, the... occasional misstep and when there is an occasional misstep go and have a conversation with that person and usually they know they crossed a line yeah so you raise a good point and and it's interesting how intent starts to be something that people interpret behind all your actions and potentially your humor as well is if the culture and if your reputation is that you people know you to be a person of good intent they'll allow a little bit more leeway if you happen to stray over the line every once in a while. But if they question whether you've got a a positive intent, then those actions are judged more harshly. So people don't realize that your ability to command trust and respect, or command is the wrong word, your ability to earn trust and respect and demonstrate it really gives you some latitude as a leader in those eventual occasional missteps and your willingness to uh, acknowledge them and apologize for them is important to maintaining your culture and it allows people to be themselves. I love how you stated that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Michael, what would your advice be? This will this will be our final question, but I'm curious uh, because your audiences are very uh, widespread, diverse from age-wise. What's your advice to someone maybe Uh, earlier on their career path, uh, trying to move ahead, do what's right, help the organization, uh, maybe get promoted. What advice would you give them as far as some tips on on how to become, uh, how to achieve their life goals essentially in the workplace? Number one tip I would give is, is ask for help, ask for advice, seek out a mentor, 
seek out a coach, ask your peers, ask people that are the same level of you that are maybe, you know, we, we tend to think, especially if you're moving into a supervisory position, a leadership role, it can be very lonely, as we say, not, not just at the top, <laughs> at any level in an organization, it being in that position. And so we tend to think of those roles as being solo sports, right? Solo endeavors. I think the more you can get away from that and reach out to other people that might be going through similar things that you're going through, where, where you can have a trusted group and talk about perhaps even some of your insecurities that you have, some of the, the concerns that you have about your job and, and moving up in the organization. But for sure, my number one advice, seek out help. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Again, asking questions is a sign of strength, never a sign of weakness. And it demonstrates that you care about your career, that you care about contributing to your organization. Most people, they, they love to be asked for advice and to be asked for help. And they will gladly offer it to you if you just reach out. Awesome. So many words of wisdom today, Michael. I, I hope what people get a sense of is, even though Michael's been around for 25 years in this uh, space as a practitioner, do you hear how he taps into his uh, research, how he taps into staying on top of the latest trends and examples? So again, uh, having seen Michael speak, knowing that he's in the Canadian Speakers Hall of Fame, um, he definitely brings a lot of energy to the keynote presentations that he does, along with the coaching and consulting work that he does. So, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. Uh, again, you want to reach Michael, you can do that at MikeKerr.com. And uh, he'd love to have a chat with you about anything that your organization is facing in the areas of culture or just trying to build a high performance team. Uh, thank so, you, Greg. And, and thank you for those kind words. That's, that's very generous of you. Thank right. you. Take care. All right. So, uh, folks, thank you for, again, uh, listening and watching the uh, Accelerating Operational Performance podcast. As you know, we do a lot of work in the areas of helping frontline leaders become more successful, but also middle managers and plant managers and site leaders in trying to balance this atmosphere of high engagement and operating performance. So if we can be of any assistance to you, start with a conversation at our website at uniquedevelopment.com. And for now, I'll just say thanks for listening and I hope you get a few ideas that you can put into action.